It's worth noting that the allocation of funding given in the previous legislation in 2004, when the Commission established was $295 million, $397 million in 2006, and $360 million in 2009. And I believe that a lot more should be done to reduce this expenditure. And I welcome um, any uh, uh, um, uh, 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 submissions and, and suggestions at how to reduce that, because I do think that as, as members of the Commission and as members of this House, we should be trying to lead the way forward into reducing the way, uh, how much this House is run. Um, given uh, um, the constitutional role of the Houses in holding the government account, the figure allocated is a small fraction of the overall estate uh, expenditure of 56.2 billion projected for 2013. But I think that all, uh, all the time we should be trying to reduce these costs. Members have taken significant co uh, cuts in their allowances and salaries. And there is a misconception that because the Commission funding covers payments of allowances and salaries member, that in some way the Commission has a say in these payments. This is not the case. The Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform is a regulatory authority under the law for setting the allowances, even though the payments are made and accounted for by the Commission. Obviously, it is only correct that the Commission could not set allowances for members, which would be, uh, uh, would be wrong, but I would question whether it is appropriate for the Minister for Public Expenditure to deal with allowances unilaterally at budget time, because I think the Commission have come up with um, suggestions on how to reduce costs around the House. And uh, the P Public Accounts Committee recommended an external body should do this work and would allow for a more transparent and measured approach in comparing with members and other parliaments. But I think that you know, we have to be upfront at how to uh, reduce our costs. The Commission's stewardship of the finances allocated have been exemplary since it's established and it's not well known because of the constitutional and statutory position of the payments that money be drawn down from the central fund by the Commission. Only 6% of the budget is discretionary with a very, very small D. This is now down to 4.7% due to the savings made by the Commission to date this year also. The annual report of the Commission gives very useful international comparisons in respect to staff, ratio of staff to members. Ireland is ranked 12 out of a total of 21 parliaments studied and 10 out of uh, 18 in terms of political staff. I think we, we should improve and we should actually strive to be in the top three in each of these cases. The conclusion can be drawn is that members are far from being the top of the league compared to other parliaments of other well-developed democracies. I feel that any review of allowances should be benchmarked against other parliaments and to ensure members remain financially independent and above reproach in carrying out their constitutional duties. Being on the Commission gives me an insight uh, into how the Houses are run by the Raptor Service. While there is room for improvement and always room for improvement, I have been impressed with the dedication and efficiency across the whole span of activities such as the Library and Research Service, which every member of this House uses uh, in supporting the sittings and the members as we go about our business in very challenging environments. Since the Commission came into uh, operation in 2004, the Service has had to adapt to its new role in supporting an independent corporate body, which effectively is known as a Commission, while at the same time managing the everyday activity of sittings in the House and sports members. The span of activity taken by the service covers far more than sittings and supporting members, important as these are, and reflects the demands of a public sector corporate body and Commission, financial and corporate governments also have primary role to ensure in such a high profile area as the Houses but financial probity is guaranteed as far as possible. The annual report of the Commission, which is largely forgotten in the overall scheme of things in Leinster House, gives a good account of the range of work being done here, which is not always widely appreciated as it should be in what is a very, very challenging environment given the, the state of public finances. All this could not have happened without the dedicated staff in the Rockta Service being committed to change and modernisation. This must be encouraged by the Commission and that's why I particularly welcome the Minister's commitment to bring forward amending legislation to, staff, uh, the cha the, to change the staff of the Houses of the Rockdust Act 1959, which I mentioned. The pressure for change is coming from the civil service itself, which I very, very much welcome. And I do thank Minister Howland for a lot of the work that has been done in the last 18 months, working very, very closely with members of the public service and the civil service to try to bring change. 
and interdepartmental groups I mentioned earlier, composed officials from Minister Howland's department with their active service. But most of all, I look forward to these changes being brought forward by the Minister, and I, I hope that this public service is, is reformed as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, Deputy John Paul Phelan has 13 minutes remaining. Thank you, Cahir. I don't think I'll be using 13 minutes, but just um, a few points that I, I want to make on, on, on the bill. Um, and I'm sorry that Deputy Fleming isn't here, but he, uh, I see his colleague is here at present. But uh, I was struck by his contribution. No less than 12 occasions he referred to today, today being Christmas Eve. And I just would hate it for him if he woke up tomorrow morning and there were no presents under the Christmas tree um, that he uh, thought that today actually was Christmas Eve, um, seeing as that's next Monday. But um, I would, perhaps the Minister might clarify in his concluding remarks, the reason for the, this particular legislation being discussed today, I would assume, is uh, that the, the changes announced by the Minister in the Budget have to be reflected in the legislation for the, uh, the budget of the Houses of the Oireachtas Commission. Um, and I would have thought that that has some bearing on the fact that uh, the legislation um, is being debated today, so close to the deadline. Um, I'm also a bit miffed um, by Deputy Fleming's earlier comments in relation to Dáil reform. He spoke about the Dáil sitting one extra day a month, and that was his notion of Dáil reform. Well, I can remember when Deputy Fleming was chairman of the Oireachtas Committee in a previous existence, and uh, there was a different regime in control uh, that uh, we would be finished for Christmas last week or the week before. Uh, the Oireachtas might return in the last two or three days of January, and might not, um, and that constituted the way that the Oireachtas was run. Um, I think a significant reduction in recess and break uh, for the Oireachtas reflects the fact um, that much more is being done in terms of legislation and discussion. And that's not to say that some of uh, the necessary changes with regards to how debates on legislation are held in the House, um, uh, you know, have been introduced because I would be unhappy with maybe some of the lack of discussion that takes place on important legislation. Uh, but it's also important to point out that we had significant legislation on a number of issues in the Iraq this last week and due to the usual messing by the opposition, there was a couple of hours lost on um, one of those particularly important bills last week. Um, uh, and reform I think will have to involve all sides of the House and I still think that there's a, a way to go in terms of reforming um, the way we handle legislation in the Oireachtas but it's certainly true to say that the Houses are sitting twice as often really as they used to be. I'm, this is my 11th year as a member of the Oireachtas and I can remember uh, recesses both for Christmas and for other breaks that were much more lengthy than they are at present. So it's it's patently just not correct to say that there has been, or oh, the only change has been an extra day on one Friday a month. Um, I'd also like to ask the Minister, in relation to the point raised by Deputy Fleming with regard to his mock indignation uh, with, uh, with regard to a lack of a banking inquiry, um, I'm led to believe, and I think I heard the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform speaking about it last week, publication of new legislation with regard to Oireachtas inquiries. Obviously, the people made a judgment last November, 12 months, in relation to uh, the powers for Oireachtas committees to investigate and the n not extending those powers in that referendum. Uh, but the Minister might be in a position to outline in his con concluding comments as to the um, uh, the status of that legislation for the necessary changes to be made to allow Oireachtas committees to hold those important inquiries into the future. In relation to ab abolition of the Shannad, I'm intrigued by Deputy Fleming's eagerness uh, to have the Shannad abolished because I was um, of the opinion that Fianna Fáil were opposed to abolition of the Shannad. Um, uh, that's this week, indeed, uh, Deputy Harris. Uh, as I understand it, and the Minister again might refer to it in his concluding remarks, that, that the uh, 
Uh, there was a time, Timmy, when you were when we were all there. But um, uh, 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 um, the, the minister might, in his concluding remarks, refer to um, position with regard to putting the issue to the people in a referendum. I'm still of the view the last that I heard on the matter was that that was to be forthcoming um, in 2013. I think it's also appropriate to acknowledge that there has been significant reductions um, in the cost of administering the Oireachtas. Uh, I can remember, um, as a member of the other House, being the finance spokesperson for Fine Gael in 2007, uh, when we discussed, or 2006, when we discussed the funding of the Oireachtas Commission, which uh, in that particular legislation was just shy of 400 million. The amount proposed for the next three years is 300 and just over 320 million which is a reduction which is certainly in line, if not ahead of um, some of the reductions in other, uh, the cost of administering other government departments and agencies. And there has been a 10% reduction in staffing levels. I'm often struck by visitors that I have to the Oireachtas who don't realize the amount of people who work in this place who are not members, who are not politicians, um, who are uh, sec secretarial assistance, parliamentary assistance of people who work um, uh, with the Rockless committees, work for political parties, people who work as ushers, people who work in the different facilities that are provided in the building, as well as um, uh, the newly extended library and research unit. And it's one thing that has been a very positive development. I can remember for the life of me, I was trying to remember the name of Patrick, the old man who used to be the, the head librarian for years, but I just can't remember. He's retired for a number of years. And himself and Seamus Hockey were the only two people who worked in the library for a long time in my early years, and effectively it was just a reading room. The service that's provided by the library and research unit now, particularly in terms of looking at legislation and giving members um, briefing on uh, legislation as proposed is a huge advance on where it was uh, previously and is something that is to be welcomed. Um, the reduction in funding included in this legislation is approaching 20% really in the last uh, four years on the cost of administering the Oireachtas through the Oireachtas Commission, which is, which is a significant reduction. Um, but it's a significant reduction which is merited because so many other uh, government spends have been reduced by similar amounts in that particular period. The final uh, issue that I, I, I want to raise with the Minister is in relation, and it is a bit of a bugbear that I've had for a while in relation to the provisions of members with iPads. Um, and I know that they're after a, a, a bit of concern expressed by myself and others and that this provision was to be done um, free to each member, that there has been some changes suggested that um, members now will be in a position correctly to um, uh, use their vouched expenses, because it is a, an expense that should be vouched, and the notion originally espoused by the Commission that each member will get a free iPad at a time when a lot of families are suffering pretty badly was an appalling suggestion, to be perfectly honest. Um, I'm glad that the option seems to, be, seems to be there now that members will be able to vouch or to use their expenses to pay for it. Um, I don't think it should be an option. Perhaps the minister should, um, maybe I'm misreading the information we've been told, um, that it should be mandatory. And likewise, for those of us, I'm not a particularly IT literate person, but I do have an iPad for years, and I don't want two of them. Um, and th those of us who already have um, access to an iPad should be in a position to use what we have already and I think that the Oireachtas uh, IT service are going to extend that service to members but I do think um, I welcome the fact that uh, a change seems to have taken place in thinking um, with regard to the provision of those important and necessary items because I'm not a Luddite uh, anything that will re reduce the cost um, of providing documents to members is to be very much welcome. And I use it myself, a member of the Justice Committee, and I use it extensively, and it involves me not having to print a small forest uh, when I'm going to committee meetings. 
Um, and I certainly welcome the fact that it's going to be available. But the notion originally espoused that it would be given free to each individual certainly was unacceptable in the current, uh, this current day and age. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, now I'll call on Deputy Timmy Dooley. Deputy has 20 minutes. Thanks very much, uh, Cahir. Look, I just welcome the opportunity to contribute to this bill. Whilst I accept uh, the bill is limited in function, I suppose it does give us an opportunity to discuss um, the whole area of, of reform within the houses of the Oireachtas. Um, it's something that I feel particularly strongly about, uh, and I, like the previous speaker, uh, Deputy Phelan, came into this house 11 years ago. We both started out in the Senate. And we contributed at that time to a significant report that was prepared about the whole reform uh, of the Shannon because that's where the focus was uh, on that particular occasion. Um, and I suppose we were cautioned by some of our peers at the time, uh, whilst our enthusiasm was, 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 was uh, marked and recognisable, um, it was indicated to, to those that, of us that around, around the house, <laughs> thank you, Minister, uh, around the house, those wiser souls, perhaps at the time, with the benefit of more experience, that it was likely to be a report that uh, would, would, would remain on the shelves for some time, as others had in the past. And sadly, that was the case. Uh, and, and I don't want to be partisan on the last day of, of, of business here this year, but the only movement we've seen from the current administration prior to um, the election was this sort of uh, effort to, um, I suppose, garner political support, garner uh, votes, um, with the notion that the Senate should be abolished, that that became the tagline for reform, and that was going to be the be-all and end-all. And I think that was disappointing, and, and, and perhaps many within the government uh, now feel the same uh, about that particular decision that was taken in advance of the election. Uh, it was certainly eye-catching, got a lot of media attention at the time, and it was vote-catching. Um, I don't think it helps or will help democracy, the removal uh, of, 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 of the Senate. I have a view that if you were to um, put a referendum to the people to abolish the doll right now, it would probably be successful. Um, so I think we must, be, we must be careful and considered in the approach that we take uh, to reform. Um, and I think it needs to be strategic. And we've got to look at, as, as others have said, um, best practice in, in other jurisdictions, notwithstanding um, our own culture, uh, where, where, where we've come from, what we have developed within the parliamentary practice. I think it has served us reasonably well uh, with some considerable failures along the way. Um, and in that context, uh, I would hope that there would be a more broadly based approach to reform of just the way we do business here. The um, development of the Oireachtas Commission, I think, was helpful at, at the outset. It needs further work. Um, the parliamentary service group, uh, reform group that we're involved in, uh, this particular uh, bill, I suppose, in bringing forward ideas um, have done good work, but they need to do more. Uh, I think you've already um, identified, Minister, or accepted that there will be further uh, amending legislation in relation to the whole area of the modernisation uh, of senior management, something which I think uh, is, is um, accepted by all those who work in the House, uh, you know, in, in recognising the new structures that need to be put in place uh, for what, what, what uh, is a modern era. Uh, and it could very easily be that the houses would become bedded in, in sort of the past rather than looking to the future. There are much a greater level of technology out there now, and I think we have to have people with expertise in that area. Uh, and I know there are some fantastic people who work in the houses who have who've really been looking for external help and support uh, in modernising uh, the houses of the Oireachtas. And I think um, whatever the minister ha has indicated he's prepared to do in that regard would be, would be most welcome. Uh, at, a later, at, a, at a later stage. Um, I think it's clear that there has been and is a very dedicated staff in this House who have worked tremendously well uh, against you know, very difficult deadlines. And there are many people who don't appreciate uh, when the business overruns here, uh, runs late into the evening, uh, that there are staff who must remain on to have amendments produced uh, and ready for uh, order of business the next morning. That's often lost. Uh, in the commentary about the cost of operations of this house that will garner a headline in relation to the number of millions when you consolidate it over uh, a three or a five year period. Um, but these are the fundamental uh, aspects of the, the running of a democracy uh, that perhaps can be tightened up, perhaps with the use of greater technology. We're, we're, we all support that. Um, but I think it would be important uh, at this stage not to undermine or in any way take from the phenomenal work that's done 
whilst at the same time then pr placing an onus uh, on the elected ones, both in government and opposition, uh, through the whip system to try to come up with you know, better systems of doing our business. Uh, it is, um, I think, a particular bugbearer for many people who look in and only see three or four in the House because they don't not that they don't understand, but they probably don't understand the way business is ordered on a daily basis. And that's why I think we have to give a much greater level uh, of um, vantage, if you want, or an extended period of time for leaders' questions and the order of business. These are the kind of, this is the opportunity where people get to discuss or get to, as parliamentarians, get to discuss issues of national importance that are current. That's ultimately what the news carries, and that's what people look to uh, on a daily basis. Perhaps it would be nice if they spent more time uh, tracking and tracing as a public the more mundane legislative proposals that may not apply to them for years to come, but, but they don't. They look, they look to Parliament for the current issues of the day. And I think we have a lot of work to do in that regard, in giving appropriate times, allowing issues to be discussed and thrashed out a little bit more. Uh, and if that entire exercise takes half a day for three days a week, well then I think, I think we'd get better engagement with the public. Um, Look, at, I, I accept that that's not something that the government uh, agrees to easily, regardless of who's in government. Uh, and it's easy from an opposition perspective uh, to identify and highlight the advantages uh, of such an approach. But I'm also mindful uh, that business has to get done and what might be considered the more mundane tasks, the thrashing out of legislation, the amending of legislation, um, and the processing of it is important work that has to be scheduled in as well. Um, and I think that's, that, that, that's, that's something that needs to be done. So, so, so in all, I would hope that uh, the Minister will, will live up to his commitments uh, in the new year to come back and bring legislation uh, that will deal with um, the modernisation in relation to the senior management structure uh, of, the, of the Arata services based on the uh, work uh, of the Parliamentary Service Reform Group. Uh, and I think in, in that event, if that amending legislation comes through, it gives us a, you know, an opportunity to discuss in more detail the kind of um, the kind of expertise, uh, the kind of access to information that's required to ensure that the houses of the Oireachtas um, remain current and in step uh, with the public uh, and have access and uh, knowledge of the latest technologies and the, the greatest capacity to communicate uh, with um, the electorate. I very much welcome the movement that has been made in relation to broadcasting on that particular channel, which I think is good. Um, I think it's unfortunately it's not freely and widely available and I would encourage uh, the government to enter into negotiations with the transition providers, whether it be RTE or TV3. Um, now with the advent we, we were led to believe of digital television uh, that there would be a much greater capacity um, to deliver channels, uh, a greater number of channels, greater flexibility there. So that's something that I know the Kion Corla has done very considerable work on and I would hope that the challenge will be met. Um, by TV3 or RTE or whoever uh, can provide that facility to the, the greatest number uh, of people, as it happens in other jurisdictions, and I just think of C-SPAN in the States, and I'm sure there are other facilitators uh, in other jurisdictions. So just to, to conclude on that, thank you very much, Cahill. Thank you, Deputy. Um, now, Deputy Patrick O'Donovan. Gormaha, good to Look, first of all, with your consent, I'd like to share my time with Deputy Harris. Is that agreed? Um, first of all, I welcome the opportunity to say a few words on, on, on the, um, the bill that's before the House, and I suppose in a general context, something maybe on the political reform uh, that's been referred to by some people, and I suppose a reference has been made to it already that under the last administration, the doll would have risen last week and wouldn't be back probably until the first week in February um, if it was lucky and then, you know, head off again for another fortnight shortly after it. And that's one very tangible thing that has been done since the new government came into office is that the recesses are shorter. And I suppose that in itself then leads to other issues because, uh, you know, we all have constituencies um, at home and uh, there's an expectation on us at home as well and in the constituencies that we should be there. But I think, you know, we have to step up and be counted that at the end of the day we have an obligation to be here. But the one thing that remar was remarkable really to me in the last fortnight or three weeks was the absence of the bulk of the opposition on the days, uh, on the Mondays and the Fridays uh, that were sitting. And I think it's regrettable because the very same people that are crowing from the rooftops that the doll wasn't sitting for, for meaningf meaningful discussions. And yet, when meaningful discussions were taking place here, uh, they were very noticeable by their absence. And I think it says an awful lot, really, about an awful lot of members of the opposition 
And I've often spoken here in Dadaal before on various different issues as a new TD, and the entire opposition benches are empty. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it doesn't just happen on one occasion, it happens on a lot. And the reality is, I suppose, that at the end of the day, the opposition have a, 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 every bit of an obligation to make sure that the chamber runs as much as the government. Uh, because in fairness to government backbenchers, I think, you know, an awful lot of government backbenchers have an awful lot of uh, very constructive and sometimes stuff that the opposition would actually agree with. But it makes it very difficult for a government backbencher when, to look across and see uh, over 80 empty seats and not even a front bench spokesperson or even a deputy front bench spokesperson from either Fianna Fáil, Sinn Féin or the technical group. And I know that today is probably an exception because we're talking about money uh, in the Houses of the Oireachtas Commission Bill, uh, so which sparked an awful lot of interest from an awful lot of varying different groups because all of a sudden there were things like receipts being requested for. So it is disappointing, you know, that people chirp an awful lot around here about how effective the, the, the government is and how effective the Oireachtas is and how effective the Dáil is. And yet, um, they'd, nearly, they'd nearly take the doors off their hinges to get out of here on a Monday or a Friday. And I think you know, it's up to themselves to, to order their own business as well and make sure their benches are, are manned. But just in relation as well, uh, Cahir, look, I suppose the House of the Oireachtas Commission have made savings as Deputy Fee and said over the time that he was in the Oireachtas. But I don't know of any other parliament in the world uh, you know, that. that that has a party that is representative in two sovereign parliaments and takes a totally different approach in two sovereign parliaments under the same flag of convenience. And I suppose what I'm referring to really is Sinn Féin come in and they talk about, you know, so-and-so, so-and-so is getting this and so-and-so, so-and-so is getting that and isn't it absolutely desperate and the cost of ministers and the cost of uh, chairmen and the cost of this and the cost of that. Well, I suppose the difference here in, in this sovereign parliament is actually that the members of it turn up to work. Uh, whereas in another sovereign parliament where Sinn Féin have representation, they don't turn up at all. And yet the cost in 2011 of their non-participation in another sovereign parliament was 697,000 euros for non-participation. Now, I suppose the only other place in the world that you might find the contents of the bill down I know. Well, I'm referring to remarks that were made earlier, Cahir, look, and, and, and they, they were left unchallenged, so I think I have a right of reply. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know of any other country in the world, maybe with the exception of North oh. Korea, where uh, people turn up uh, when they feel like it and draw money out of it and yet don't participate in any kind of a meaningful way. And to be honest about it, I think it's, it smacks of hypocrisy to be coming in talking about the cost of governance and the cost of, of the houses of the Oireachtas and the cost of the Commission and the cost of everything else, while at the same time there are five members of Parliament in Westminster in receipt of €697,000 from Her Majesty's Treasury and not a geek out of them. And I think that smacks of total hypocrisy. And by the same token, if there's people in the House that feel that they're, you know, that, that, that they're overpaid in here, there is nothing at all stopping them, stopping them of going to the Paymaster General and say, reduce my pay. But I haven't heard a single member of Sinn Féin saying that they would do that. Or I haven't heard of anybody say that they would do that. But I think, like, you know, there was also reference made by earlier contributions about the cost of running political parties uh, versus the cost of being an independent. Well, I think, to be honest about it, the electorate actually expect political parties to run the country. And they don't expect, you know, that you'd be able to cobble together a government out of a group of independents because it probably wouldn't last that long anyway. So by virtue of the fact that we have a, a Standards and Public Offices Commission, that we have regulations in terms of, of uh, fundraising, and that we have maximum limits, the reality is that the cost of running political parties is quite expensive. And it's expensive because of the demands that are placed on all of us as politicians. So as a result of that, the leader's allowance is different for political parties and what it is for independents. And I think, and I've raised it here before the budget on several occasions, it was immoral that there were members of this House in receipt of a leader's allowance without a single receipt. And it was essentially an extra payment of 43,000 into the pocket. And I'm glad that the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform has made some effort to try and address that, but I think more needs to be done. Because it is an oxymoron. You cannot be a leader of yourself. You're either an independent or a member of a political party. But if you're going to be a technical group, vote as a party, speak as a party, I said it here before, kick members out as a party, hold parliamentary party meetings, elect leaders 
that to my mind is a political party and I think the farce that's going on here where people are one hand pretending you know we're independents and on the other hand behaving as a political party and kicking people out and bringing them in as they see fit setting their rules holding meetings and having whips flies in the face of what it is to be an independent and the people I actually think yeah yeah the people that I think that are the people that I think that are actually true independents are people who have absented themselves from that farce that we call a technical group because the way I look at it is you're either an independent or you're a party but there's a group here there's a group here that want their cake and eat it and when and when someone stands up to speak a bit of the truth it hurts because I don't know any other I don't know any other country in the world where you could have a group of people who have nothing in common from the extreme right to the extreme left and everything in between and they take a big ball of money and they take a big ball of money and they call themselves a technical group they speak as one they vote as one and they're whipped as one that in my mind in, this, in, in my in my estimation and in most people's estimation Please. that is a political party and they should do the decent thing and call themselves a party and i think and i'm glad that the chief whip is here the standing orders of this house really should reflect what people look for if people elect independence they should be forced into behaving as independents and they shouldn't be paid as a party and i think to be honest about it the behavior yes. here like government backbenchers oftentimes kahir look have, have the same level of speaking time in this chamber and i've said it to the government yes, chief so before as members of the technical group and i find it you know it's very difficult there's over there's over 70 members of the backbenchers between Fine Gael and labor and we're being treated the very same in terms of speaking time as a group that have cobbled together an arrangement to call it a technical group. And it's totally, and it's totally, I, no one interrupted you, no one interrupted you. Please, no please, interrupted you. please, please, no one, one speaker. You. And it's, it, is, it is very unfair. And I think, I think, Cahir, look, that after Christmas, as part of the, the, I suppose, the move for political reform, that the Oireachtas should actually reflect its representation <coughs> in terms of the speaking rights here. And I think it should be more representative of the people in terms, in, terms of the, in terms of the makeup of the House and in terms of the representation within the House. It's totally unfair that government backbenchers have the same level of speaking time as a group that cobble themselves together. That's, that's not right and it's something I think, Chief Whip, I would ask you to take on board. Just in relation to the Houses of the Oireachtas Commission and, uh, and the bill that's before the House as well, I would like to compliment the staff of the House and I think the previous speaker made... made made very good points in terms of the, the work that is done in terms of school tours and things like that as well. <coughs> but I think an awful lot more could be done, Cahir, look, in terms of actually taking the message of the Oireachtas out to the people and in terms... Yeah, Gormahagut. And in terms of trying to encourage people to come into the House. So I, I welcome the bill, I welcome the opportunity to speak. But I think, you know, every now and again, it go, it, it's no harm that a bit of truth is injected into uh, debate in this chamber. And obviously, when, when some, people, some people, of course, when they get the truth, they get a bit rattled and they start roaring and shouting. That's their entitlement. But I think at the end of the day, when, when we're talking about the cost of running this House and the cost of politics, we need to be fair to everybody, political parties and those outside of political parties and those that are a political party, but pretend that they're not one. Gur Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. well, I thought you'd use all the time. Look, ten minutes. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, or here, look. So it was even in the trenches of the world wars, peace broke out over Christmas. So uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to, keep my, to, 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 uh, to leave the comments of my colleague to one side. I, I wasn't intending on, on speaking on, the, on this bill, but I just <laughs> wanted to, to add a few thoughts that I'd had whilst listening to contributions about political reform. Because whilst an awful lot of this focus of this bill is obviously on the monetary amounts that it costs, to run a parliament. There obviously is a cost associated with democracy and there is a cost associated with having democratic institutions. I think what my, my constituents and I presume many other people's constituents really want to know is how effective are we in here and what are they getting in return? What is the bang for the book, so to speak? And in that regard, I think there are just a couple of suggestions and I'm, I'm also pleased that the government chief whip is here and might take note of these suggestions in relation to the running of this uh, of this Oireachtas. But to start with the positive, I think, I mean, there's absolutely no doubt that this, this House and indeed the other are sitting more, we're having more sittings than before. And that has to be very welcome because, I mean, an additional sitting in itself is a metric 
of the level of work and debate and legislation being dealt with. I think the Friday sittings in relation to providing all members on all sides of the House, but particularly, I suppose, backbench government TDs who never before had a mechanism through private members or whatever else to actually table legislation, actually puts it up to us to be legislators. Because we can now go to the doors in our constituencies in the next general election, which I hope is very far away, and we can actually knock on the doors and be measured on what did we do in terms of bringing forward legislative proposals. You had an opportunity to draw up a bill to try to change a law. What did you actually do? And I think that's a very important change as well. We also have an, we also have an opportunity now to see the heads of the bills actually going to committees before they're actually fully fleshed out. That is a very positive. However, today, one example, I suppose, of things that aren't so positive. I'm a member of the Oireachtas Finance Committee, a member of the Public Accounts Committee, as is Deputy MacDonald, the two, the two committee meetings, both dealing with very important topics, sitting at the same time. Now, I think we can learn from other parliaments in relation to that, where there are often days or weeks or a period of time that can be assigned to committee business. Because what I've learned in my time in this House, in my brief time in this House, is a lot of the most effective work done is actually done in committees, often where there is less partisanship uh, and, and a greater degree of scrutiny of the proposals before committees. So I do think we need to look at how we timetable the committees in this House. How long have I got, got to speak? Uh, oh, you still have seven minutes. Okay, yeah, the, um, the, the other issue I think we need to look at is empowering the committees actually more in terms of their own work program. Um, I actually am a, a believer in this ideal, ideological idea of everyone gets a free vote on every issue. But I do think when you're at a committee and you're not dealing with legislative issues, there is certainly the scope. Committees should be entitled to, to call speakers before the committee, you know, and people shouldn't have to divide along party lines. And it's been disappointing when that has happened on a couple of occasions in this stall as well. I think also, and Deputy Dooley, I think, referred to it in relation to current issues, the ability the topical debates are, are a great creation in addition to this House, and they have helped members. But I do still think that this House is a little bit too rehearsed and stayed at times. And I think we need to look at the likes of the House of Commons, if you don't mind me referring to it after the last contribution. <laughs> yeah, we do need to look at the House of Commons, I suppose, where every MP has the opportunity to actually raise issues with the Prime Minister of the day on a regular basis. And I think that, that needs to look at, be looked at as well. We don't just need the what others have referred to and then continue to do themselves. We don't just need the punch and duty politics where you know, and the, our constituents at home look at the television screens and they think that's what goes on in the doll. So I do think we need to constantly be looking at mechanisms. I also think as we're about to encounter uh, another recess, I do think we need to look at how we, how we also timetable recesses. I know in the European Parliament, they have this idea of a constituency week. One of the great challenges I've found as a TD is actually finding the thinking time and the reading time that you actually need to do your job effectively. And particularly, again, in relation to committee works, and I think any TD, any member of this House that's going to be honest with themselves and indeed with their constituents, we can run around this place and be very busy and go from morning right through to night time. But the actual opportunity to have that space to sit down, to plan, to work on your parliamentary questions, you know, to actually be good legislators and to contribute well. I think the European Parliament model um, albeit done for a slightly different reason, of having a constituency week or a time aside, not necessarily a week, but a period of time which is designated where you're not on holidays, but that there's actually time to, to scrutinise and to think. I think that's something that needs to be considered. And I also think the European Parliament's idea of having votes at a certain time of the day or a certain time of the week is also a good idea. This idea of you're in the middle of a meeting and the bells ring and everyone has to get up and the witnesses at committees are left sitting there waiting for ages um, is, is a little bit... I don't want to call it time wasting, but I think it's an ineffective use of time. We obviously need to have votes. It's obviously the right of members to call votes, and it's a very important part of our work here. But I think how we group those votes together is something, if we're truly honest about spending our time effectively here, and indeed, as Deputy Dooley referred to, the cost that overrun that can happen when votes run into late into the night and the likes, I think we need to look at how we actually group together uh, voting times. I think great work has been done, and great work is due to the Oireachtas Commission, led by the Ceann Corla, in relation to the broadcasting of proceedings here. This house is really becoming much more accessible through, uh, through the new television channel, also through the internet, even in relation to, excuse me, members' expenses being displayed on a monthly basis on the website. I think that's really great work. I do think it's unfortunate, and I want to take the opportunity to record this, that KildareStreet.com, a website that has done great work in relation to transparency, in, tr in relation to tracking all of our performances, saying how many parliamentary questions you would ask versus your constituency colleague, that that website seems to be having difficulty um, due to changes in how the Oireachtas processes its information. And I, I would ask that the Government Chief Whip and the Oireachtas Commission would look at how we can facilitate KildareStreet.com in continuing its work. Um, two final issues. I'm involved in a, in a cross-party group, um, actually with Deputy O'Sullivan, in relation to mental health. 
and I mean, this is a group that has uh, representatives of every grouping, um, political parties or, or political groupings in the House. And, and it, again, it does, I think it does solid work in the sense that we've all come together. We know that we're coming at it from a different perspective. We know there'll be debates in here where we take different sides as, as political needs most at times. But we're coming together to try to park the party politics and move forward the issues in a broad sense. Now, again, other parliaments have a great tradition of cross-party groups. Outside of our formal Oireachtas structures here, we're not great at doing it. And I do think it's something that should be looked at. I don't know whether it's something that members, that we just need to get on with and do ourselves, or whether we need to actually look at through the, through the formal process of the Oireachtas. But cross-party groupings to look at different kind of sectoral interests or societal interests, I think is a very useful uh, way. And they don't necessarily need to be formal legislative Oireachtas committees. And the final point I would make, I had corresponded with the Kian Corla about this before, is the opening up of Parliament. Um, you can actually queue outside the Westminster Parliament and gain access to the building. I do still think it is regrettable that if my constituents want to access this building um, at short notice, that they generally need me or one of my constituency colleagues or another member to sign them in, or they need to go through formal booking processes. Now, I've corresponded with the Kian Corla and officials in the House, and I got a very comprehensive answer, and I understand about staffing and security and all this sort of stuff, but I do think it's... It's, it's okay, that's okay. I look after my constituents, Chief Whit. But I, I, do think, I do think that people need, it is something that needs to be looked at. Um, I've often seen people come up to the, uh, to the reception area out on Kildare Street and ask, how do you come in? And I think that's a bad physical barrier to have. Um, and I don't think it's something we're going to be able to rectify today or tomorrow, but it's just something I would note. And the other point that I would note while I'm on my feet is the idea of the tours of this house are of a superb nature. Anybody that you bring in and any group that you bring in I, I, they're always go away massively impressed with the depth of knowledge, the courtesy um, that's extended to them by the staff of this house. And that, that's something that I really value as a member of this house. But I do think it's, it's regrettable, and again, it, I know it's as a result of the economic situation in which we find ourselves, that there's no longer the possibility of evening tours, because there's a significant catchment of our constituents that would like to see this house and would like to watch this house in action and aren't actually able to avail of them during the day. So I just place them down as my general thoughts on the issue. But I would ask that when we are discussing issues in relation to the cost. Obviously, we all need to be cost conscious and we need to make cost savings, and we are in this bill and we have in the budget in relation to the cost of our institutions. We do also need to ask what we're getting for the money and not just have the debate about euros, but actually about value for money and, and that phrase, bang for your buck. And they're just uh, some of my suggestions for what they're worth. Thank you. Um, thank you, Deputy. We now call on the Minister to conclude the debate. Thank you very much, um, Cahirli, and there's been an interesting um, discussion. As um, colleagues have uh, acknowledged, the legislation that's before the House is very much of a, a technical nature, although it's, it's very important, um, it is relatively limited um, in scope. But m many of the issues um, that have been raised in the course of the debate are, of course, worthy of debate, of public debate and elaboration and um, members in their normal ingenious way have taken the opportunity afforded to them by this relatively limited piece of legislation to engage in that broader uh, in that broader debate and i think it is of course it's appropriate in the dial that there should be a, a, a constant uh, uh, engagement on the question of reform reform of the manner in which the houses uh, uh, do their business but also the broader agenda of reform which this government is pursuing um, I think in a very impressive uh, uh, manner, uh, all the way from constitutional reform through the convention, uh, across the board to uh, matters such as reform of freedom of information, uh, the lobbying regime in, uh, in this country, uh, elect election funding, uh, and so forth, in various pieces of legislation, other instruments that have been considered in these houses. So there is reform and a very considerable uh, amount of reform uh, proceeding uh, all, all the time. But this particular piece of legislation, as I say, is quite limited. And I think it's, uh, it's striking, actually, and I don't say this by way of criticism of any of my colleagues, uh, far be it for me to do that, but it is striking how little reference there was by practically anyone in the course of the debate to the contents of the legislation itself. Um, very little, very, very little indeed. Um, uh, the bill, of course, uh, ensures, if it's passed um, uh, by the House, will ensure that the Oireachtas Commission uh, will continue, can continue uh, with its work, and more importantly, should, have, should continue to have the funding in order to be able to uh, continue uh, with its work. And uh, can I just say that in relation to the timing of the debate and timing of the introduction of the legislation, I was struck, and I Deputy Phelan actually, I think, dealt with it, uh, quite well, if I may say so, in relation to Deputy Fleming's open remarks, when he was talking about uh, 
uh, this being Christmas Eve or this being the eve of Christmas, and there was a sense in which uh, things were being rushed through in a manner, and I think Deputy MacDonald also used the word sneaking through, if I'm not mistaken, you know, one or two other people said the same. This is a working day in the House of the Oireachtas. Th 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 we are working today, doing the people's business up until eight o'clock tonight. There's nothing sneaking about any of the business that we do, either today or any other day. This is just as an important day uh, of work as any other day. So the notion that it's on the last day of the session, that that constitutes some form of, uh, some sort of, some kind of sneaky uh, behaviour on the part of the government or anyone else, is nonsensical. Absolutely nonsensical. And the media and everybody else have the same gaze and the same visibility on what we do in these houses right up until the business closes this evening. So this, this the, I, I must say I reject out of hand any suggestion that because, of, because it's been taken on the last day that it has somehow uh, uh, you know, uh, been pushed through in a manner that's, uh, that's sneaky or that is uh, seeking to avoid the public, uh, the public gaze or public scrutiny. That is absolutely not the case. The second thing is, of course, in relation to the sums of money that are involved here, the estimate, the original uh, uh, estimate uh, of the sums of money contained in this bill to be dedicated and, uh, to the House of the Oireachtas has been known since October last. And the estimate was in fact uh, uh, presented in October of this year, following very detailed consideration between the Minister for Public Expenditure and, and Reform on the one hand and the House of the Oireachtas Commission on the other. So there's no lack of clarity and there's no lack of visibility or, trans or there's no lack of transparency in relation to the process involved here or the sums of money involved. And I reject absolutely any, suge any suggestion uh, otherwise. Um, so I, I think this, it's, it's important that we should, we should be conscious of that. And Deputy Phelan, I think, very fairly uh, uh, made the point also that in terms of the, the, the timing that we're coming to the end of the session, it is true that the decisions made in the budget are of relevance and decisions, the alterations and adjustments made in the budget announcements are of relevance to this. And they came, I think it is, uh, about two weeks ago. And there is pressure of, of, uh, government, uh, of government business and legislative business. Uh, the personal insolvency bill, for example, uh, which was just passed by the Houses last night, and there is quite a lot of legislation going through the Houses, and members will recognise that and can see that. Much of it uh, Troika-related legislation that has to be uh, dealt with and is being dealt with, I think, if I may say so, in the presence of the Chief Whip and, the, and others, being dealt with in an, ex in, in an expeditious fashion and in an efficient fashion. By, um, by all concerned, including in particular the staff of the houses and the, the staff and civil servants and government departments who have a huge amount of work to do in relation to legislation uh, right across the board. Um, on the question of uh, reform generally, and I don't because I made the point uh, already coherently that many of the issues that were raised in the course of the debate are not strictly speaking relevant to the legislation, so I should stick to that and not respond to it, I suppose, so I was going to be consistent. But I think I can have some indulgence for a couple of minutes just simply to refer briefly to some of the points that were made. I've said already that there is a reform agenda, and the, the government is pr vigor pursuing vigorously a reform, uh, a reform agenda. Um, and I think that the, the issue of committees um, is an important one. And Deputy O'Sullivan, I think, and others raised this, the importance of committees and the difficulties sometimes in in the uh, passage of business or the efficiency or otherwise of, of, of committees. And I think that's something that we should be constantly addressing our minds. So I was the chair of a committee myself prior to my appointment into this position. And I believe very strongly in the committee system in these houses. And I think it can work and it can have been seen to work and can be made work. And it involves the cooperation uh, and support, uh, not just of the government, but of all the members of the committees, so that they actually genuinely work in a kind of methodical, efficient way that they're designed to do. And I think that we have, seen, we have seen progress in that regard. And I think when people genuinely are working together in a committee type environment, they, we, we can make huge progress in, in, in dealing with legislation, but also dealing with other issues. And one of the things that's being done in committees, and it's a very important reform, is that we have now a system of pre-legislative scrutiny in committees. So prior to the bill even being published, there's an opportunity afforded for there to be pre-legislative discussion in the committee. And I, I was uh, privileged to be involved in some of that work in the Finance Committee in relation, for example, to credit union legislation, the whistleblowers legislation, and so on. And it's happening, I believe, at the moment, just to answer the question about the about inquiries and banking inquiries. As I understand it, if I'm not uh, 
incorrect in this, that in the finance, uh, finance Committee at the moment, in recent days, they've in fact been looking at the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform's proposals for inquiries. The preparation of legislation is, has already been approved by government uh, in order to allow for the holding of inquiries by committees not just a banking inquiry, but the holding of inquiries generally by committees. And the Finance Committee is, and, public, and the Finance and Public Expenditure and Reform Committee is having an opportunity to deal with that prior to the legislation uh, even being uh, uh, finalised by the Minister. That's an important, uh, it's an important advance because it's often been said that in the preparation of legislation in these houses, that when it, when it comes out, when it's published, there's often a feeling, and I don't know whether this is fair or not, but there's often a feeling that once it's published, there's a sense, some sense of finality about it, that there's a, that there may, a reluctance, perhaps it's a perceived reluctance that's there to change legislation once it's published. Here's an opportunity for genuine engagement by parliamentarians before the legislation, in fact, uh, reaches the publication stage at all. And I think that's extremely important and very progressive. Somebody, uh, some, some colleagues were asking Deputy Fleming, I think Deputy Phelan pointed out that Deputy Fleming appeared very enthusiastic uh, for there to be some uh, announcement soon in relation to the Senate and the uh, uh, proposal to hold a referendum on the question of uh, abolition or otherwise of the Senate. Um, I was quite taken aback, uh, or quite, quite, I thought, thought it was quite striking how enthusiastic Deputy Fleming was for that. But I think the, the position remains that there, the, the Taoiseach has indicated, and it has been indicated by the government, that that matter, that matter will be addressed in the, in the latter part of 2013. And that is the intention of the government in terms of bringing forward proposals in that regard. But it should be emphasised again that the people own the constitution and the people own, as it were, if I can use that term, the houses of the Oireachtas. And it will be a matter for the people to decide whether the Senate is abolished. Not a matter for the government or indeed for this House ultimately or the other house, it would be a matter for the people to determine that, and that's as it should be. Um, the uh, question of the figures themselves, just to return briefly to the, well, uh, perhaps I'll do, that, I'll do that in conclusion, because just on the question of uh, the, Deputy Dooley made a, made a point that struck me, I must say, in the course of his contribution, and he made it, I suppose, with some, made it somewhat, somewhat lightly, in the sense that he was saying uh, rhetorically that if there was a referendum held tomorrow or, or, or next week proposing the abolition of the Dáil, he thought that that would succeed. Uh, and, you know, we can laugh at that, pro that prospect uh, as, we, as, we, as we see fit. But actually, of course, there's a very serious issue at the heart of that point that he made. And he didn't, and I'm not criticising Deputy Dooley because I know where he was coming from. You know, the idea that uh, this is a parliamentary democracy, and we live in a parliamentary democracy. We live in a, in a country which is free to determine who its uh, um, representatives are, whether they're members of political parties or independents or anybody else. And people have an opportunity to vote us in here and vote us out. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves of that, how important it is that we should defend that and we should uphold that. And we should defend the integrity of this parliament. And that leads on to some of the issues that are, are relevant to this piece of legislation. And Deputy O'Sullivan very fairly stated at the outset of her contribution, and others did too, and it seems like almost like a truism that doesn't have to be repeated, but I think maybe we should. It does cost money to run a parliamentary democracy. You can't run a parliamentary democracy without funding it. Now, you can have legitimate queries as to how much people should be, politicians should be paid or what their expenses ought to be, whether they should be vouched. In my view, they, I always thought they should. All of those issues that have been raised by deputies. But let's not lose track of the fundamental point here, which is that we live in a parliamentary democracy and we should uh, recognise that fact and have the, the confidence as politicians to defend that. As members of this House sent here on the trust of the people, we should defend that and defend the necessity to fund it. And I have to say that sometimes you know, the issue of individual uh, specifics of the allowances and expenses and so on are not, not germane uh, in terms of their, 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 their amount to the issues in this debate. But I have no objection, and I think members are perfectly entitled to be critical of this or that allowance or the level of it. But sometimes I think that debate, and I have to say, sometimes it, it, it degenerates and, and was in danger of degenerating in the course of this debate, to this, you know, this constant hacking away at the issue of allowances and, 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 and salaries. It seems to me risks, if it's not calculated to actually enhance uh, and encourage resentment and cynicism about the whole process of politics and parliamentary democracy. 
By all means, you're entitled to raise specific issues. But when it degenerates, of course, it's very good copy that makes excellent copy to constantly hack away at that issue. But I would ask colleagues sometimes just to have regard to the importance of defending the integrity of the work that we're doing here at the people's business and the fact that it actually does cost money, not just to pay our salaries, but to pay the salaries and uh, emoluments uh, of all of the people who work for us here and work in this building and work in this process. It's an extremely important job that they do uh, for, 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 the, uh, for our state. Um, the question of... Um, the question of the, I think I should just put on the record um, as I come to a conclusion clearly, because I think it, just in respect of the figures, I've said already that there was a, there was a, there was a, a detailed uh, discussion on the, the the specifics of the budget between uh, involving the commission and, and the minister. But I think for the purpose of the house, it is appropriate that I just put on the record what the what the uh, the envisaged expenditure for 2012 in the context of this uh, of this bill. Is, is, is it's the major elements of the 116 million euro envisaged for 2012 are as follows. 24 million for salary costs for the houses of the Oireachtas service. 21 million for salary costs for members of both houses and for MEPs. 11 million euro for travel expenses and allowances for members. 21 million euro in respect of the salaries of secretarial assistants for members and 15 million uh, euro for pensions for former members of the houses. That's a total of 92 million clearly. The remaining annual allocation of 24 million consists mainly of general administration expenses of 17 million euro, which are travel and subsistence, postal and telecommunications, office machinery, office premises expenses and so forth. Payments in respect of bar and catering staff is 2 million euro and finally the televising of Rochester's proceedings at 3 million euro, an important uh, item of expenditure. I would, I would suggest to Cahirli in the context of the, 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 the imperative that the business and the work in these houses is communicated properly and fully and in an accessible way to the public whose um, business we are actually, uh, we are actually doing here. Um, there, there, there were many other issues um, uh, Cahirli, which, I won't, which I won't dwell on. Uh, some I found myself uh, in considerable agreement with, others I have to say that I didn't, and there was one, if I may say so, in, uh, may just briefly uh, deal with before I sit down, because it's been raised a couple of times, a couple of times in relation to the efficiency of individual members, and this is something of a personal kind of bugbear of mine. It's come up in the in the context of this of the controversy, if I can call that, about iPads. Now, I've been struck. I was in the other house, and a member of this house, been struck sometimes by. First of all, the sheer volume of paper that we carry around with us, we feel necessary to carry around with this piece of legislation and, uh, 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 and otherwise. And secondly, when you're discussing a piece of, uh, 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 say, an amendment, like this bill, for example, how many members in this house here at the moment would have available to them quickly the Principal Act? You would, they wouldn't have the Principal Act with you. In fact, I think I had to ask the officials for just to have a look at the Principal Act, because you would normally have issued to you the amendment bill, and it'll tell you, what you what's being amended, and very often you're scratching your head and saying, wouldn't it be good to look at the Principal Act just to see where it fits in? Okay, you'd have to go get that from the library. Some people are very assiduous and they do that, but most of us don't frankly have the time to do that. How much better would it be if people did in fact have an iPad, they were adept at using it, they could quickly find pieces of legislation, including the Principal Act that they were debating, they could go from one to the other, they could actually even be able to access quickly commentary in relation to some aspects of the legislation they were debating, all together in front of them. Now, it seems to me that sometimes we lose sight of what we can achieve by way of efficiencies, doing our job more efficiently, doing our jobs better. And it's cloaked then by this notion of TDs being given a free iPad, like as if it was something they were going to find under the Christmas tree that for their delectation and enjoyment. You see, we never actually deal with the issue seriously because, as I say, it makes great copy to talk about these things as if they're free being thrown around the place. And I would say there's very few people that would ever come in here and would think that they were going to get the opportunity to have freebies in the way that that's been characterised. So anyway, that's just a small matter that I think is of importance and we should take seriously. And we should, let's take our business in here more seriously as politicians and as TDs on both sides of the house. And we're at risk sometimes of not doing that. But on, 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 the, uh, on the bill, I thank uh, colleagues for their contributions. It's an important, as I say, limited piece of legislation and I think it, it, it deserves the support of the house. Thank you, uh, Minister. Um, 
That brings the debate to a close, and um, I now have to put the, um, the question to the House that the bill be read a second time. Is that agreed? Agreed. Not agreed. Those in favour say thaw. Those in favour say nil. Nail. I think the question is carried.